Okay, in this week's video, I really wanted to talk about what biomaterial you should be using for extraction sockets. So it's a topic that comes up very, very frequently. And I've titled this, uh, this week's message, why allografts should be used exclusively instead of xenografts. And this, of course, comes in the countries where you can use allografts because, of course, allografts are forbidden in some countries. Now, when we look at this little chart here, this is coming directly from uh, the Next Gen Biomaterials textbook. When you actually put a grafting material, such as an allograft or xenograft, into the extraction site, typically the particle size is around the same thing. Okay? Typically people are trying to get you know, the three, 400 uh, microns up to 1200, let's say, into these sites. The difference between the two, of course, is that the allografts are resorbable. The xenografts typically are non-resorbable, so BIOS is the perfect example. And um, the xenograft is called deproteinized bovine bone mineral because it's deproteinized. No proteins, no growth factors, okay? Um, in this case here, you'll notice that in the image, at four months, the allograft is resorbed, so it's getting resorbed and their particles are getting smaller. The xenografts remain the same size. The difference between the two now is when we create these osteotomies, so we start cutting through bone, we're gonna cut through some of the particles that are left over, okay? If you pack, uh, any of these grafts, you're going to naturally cut through some of these particles. And then when your implant goes in, the one difference is that we're looking for bone implant contact. So in a perfect world, we want, you know, good bone to implant contact, so BIC. With the xenografts, of course, is the more that are hanging around, the more that are found in this area, the more that are coming in contact with the implant surface, of course, as these get screwed in. And the more, over time, they just never go away. Okay, so the advantage here with an allograft is that one year later, the allograft is completely resorbed and gone, the implant's integrated. With the xenograft, the xenograft is going to be there long term. And of course, if you ever have any type of peri-implant related issue, uh, such as peri-implantitis, you know, those particles, they never go away. And bacteria can grow on them, etc. So this is not really an area where you know, clinicians recommend using xenografts. Of course, this is not to say that xenografts should not be utilized. They're utilized for many different procedures, such as sinus grafting, uh, contour augmentation techniques, bone augmentation, etc. But in this specific indication, you know, have a look at this part of the book chapter and read about it and think about it logically. Ideally, with what you want with these implants is good bone implant contact. And what occurs with these xenografts is because they never resorb, they're always there, some of them are hanging around in these defects, and you don't get as good long-term maintenance of, of these cases. So that's it for this week. Like I said, we looked at the difference between allografts and xenografts, and in future weeks we'll look at where we should be using xenografts and where they're actually indicated. Thank you.